Good evening. It's Saturday, January 19th, and we're going to do our Transparency Check-In Challenge Live. Tonight I'm going to be talking about inflammation and how it affects autoimmune disorders and intermittent fasting. We are at a point now, we are in our third week, and lots of people are no longer hungry. They're not wanting to eat. Hey, Becky. Is it snowing where you're at? It's just pouring rain here. It's just miserable. It's just cold, cold rain. Ugh. I've been doing housework all day. and ugh. I hate doing housework. I told y'all I'm not a good housekeeper. It's not my favorite thing. But, hey Angie, I got to have a really great conversation with Angie today at Walmart. It was awesome getting to see her and hug her neck and just chit-chat for a minute, check in. Hey Ruth, oh, oh Lord Becky, ah, eight inches in three hours, yuck. Hey Brianna, and y'all, I did not put my phone on Do Not Disturb, so Lord have mercy. Oh, thank you. It's not a jacket. It's just a shirt. It's just a top. I know your generation calls them jackets. That's My kids call hoodies jackets. Hoodies are not jackets. They're sweatshirts with hoods. Thank you, Angie. Angie got to see me and we talked for... It's a Sherpa. It is. I like my Sherpa. I bought this during the Black Friday sale, I think. But y'all know I don't I don't turn my heaters on if I can help it to keep the power bill down and so I'm be bopping around in my Sherpa. Hey Lynn. Four days and I get to see you, I get to hold a baby. My Nevaeh Grace will be here sometime on Thursday, y'all. We don't know what time yet. But they set her C-section date. And so Miss Nevaeh Grace will be coming into this world on the 24th. And I'm going over on the 25th. And going to spend some time helping mom and dad when they are getting ready to go home from the hospital. And helping them get settled in. And of course getting my baby lovings. This will be... Different for me, though, because I was there when Joshua was born. I was actually there in the room and got to see him born, but this is a C-section, so I won't get to do that. And I feel like it's just better if they get to spend that time and I'll stay here and take care of my patient and come over the next day and give them a little bit of break because I guarantee you they'll be tired. <laughs> I doubt it. I doubt that I'll get to have the baby on the live because I doubt that we'll be back at the house. I'll probably be doing my lives from the car, to be honest. In fact, on, on Friday, I know I'll be doing my live from the car because we'll be on the road. Me and Hannah are leaving here about 1 o'clock or so, right around there. And it's about a six-hour drive to Fayetteville, so... I'll probably be doing my live somewhere on the road or from a hospital lobby. <laughs> but y'all get to see what the Sassy Keto Nurse does on a road trip. I haven't done one of those in a long time. I certainly will. I will call you as soon as the live is over. So anyways, y'all, so today, I spent some time today working on the house and stuff, but I also started watching some videos with Jason Fung. I am very interested in Jason Fung's fasting approaches. I talked last night about the mental block that I have when it comes to extended fasting. I very easily, when I am fat adapted, do a 20 hour fast a day and just have a four hour eating window. But I was really interested in the benefits of the extended fasting. So I watched a couple of YouTube videos and um, interviews with him today. And I'm going to share some of that information tonight. But first, I want to talk about inflammation and autoimmune diseases. 
because that is something that comes up a lot and we see a lot of success with people that have autoimmune disorders in the ketogenic lifestyle and people wonder why well the thing is is that inflammation which is caused from increased cytokines and chemokines which are the inflammatory responses in our body it's a cellular thing okay it's very scientific and all that and I won't get into all of that but that inflammatory response is what causes many of the autoimmune disorders and when I say autoimmune disorders I'm just gonna name off several that I sat here and thought of and if y'all know of more let me know but lupus rheumatoid arthritis allergies just regular old allergies, y'all. That's an inflammatory response. PCOS, psoriasis, Hashimoto's, which is infl inflammation in the thyroid and with the thyroid processes. Fibromyalgia. People on keto see such incredible improvement in their pain levels with fibromyalgia because of the lowering of inflammation. Celiac disease and other GI disorders, IBS, Crohn's, all of those good things. Type 1 and type 2 diabetes. Now, type 1 is not so much an inflammation disorder because it is actually a disorder of the pancreas. The pancreas does not produce insulin and therefore they have to take in exogenous insulin, which is synthetic. Hi, Candice. And so it's not really an inflammatory, but type 2 diabetes causes all kinds of inflammation. Multiple sclerosis, SLE, which is also a form of multiple sclerosis, food sensitivities, all of these things are caused by inflammation. Now, with inflammation, why does the keto diet lower inflammation? It's because the body does not respond sarcoidosis. Yes, absolutely. Anything that's got an osis or an itis on the end of it means inflammation. Okay, itis is inflammation like bursitis. Um, I, now, that's what I've heard, Candace. Becky was telling me they've gotten eight inches in the last three hours. You guys up there can keep all that stuff. I've got a ton and ton and ton of rain coming down here, but no snow, and I don't want any. I do not like snow. I do not drive in snow, and therefore I get shut down and can't do nothing when it snows. So here's the thing. You have these things in your body called T-cells. Now, people hear about T-cells when they talk about AIDS and HIV and all that kind of stuff and their T-cell count and all that. But the reason that they talk about T-cells is the T-cells are like the regulatory system of the body. They're the ones that go around and police what's going on. They go around and they say, oh, no, 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 this is not okay. I'm going to lock you up for a while and I'm going to take you out of the system and, you know, that kind of thing. Well, your metabolic state it governs how you react, how your body reacts, how your cells react, how those T cells react. When you cut yourself, then the T cells in your body are what calls on your white blood cells and all of those things to come to that area and to form a scab from the inside out, okay? The same thing is going on when you get inflammation in your joints, in your bloodstream, in your gut, in your respiratory system, in your brain, okay? The same thing. It calls upon an inflammatory response, then things get inflamed and swollen up because they're trying to fix it, trying to fix it, trying to fix it. But there's no way to fix it because there's no solution. Jason Fung in this video that I just heard, he made one of the best comments that I've heard in so long because we have been we have been just an, inundated with the calorie in calorie out thing calorie restriction you'll lose weight well that's not actually true because the truth is is that your body has no idea what a calorie is we do we know how to find out how many calories are in a food and then we just assume 
that if you burn that many calories, then, then you're fine. Well, here's the thing. Your body doesn't know what a calorie is. Your body runs on hormonal responses. So take, for instance, and this is what Jason Fung said in the interview. It was just the perfect example. Say you take 100 calories of olive oil and 100 calories of a chocolate brownie. If you drink 100 calories of olive oil, there's no insulin response. And what does insulin do? Insulin, when insulin goes up, it tells your body to hold on to food stores for later energy when you're not getting food. So it tells your body to store fat. Okay, that's what the insulin response does. Insulin says, hold on to this. You drink 100 calories of olive oil, there's no insulin response. So your body doesn't hold on to that olive oil. It doesn't shuttle it into your fat cells to hold on to it. It doesn't blow up some fat cells and help you to gain some weight there. It utilizes it, okay? But if you take in 100 calories of chocolate brownie, which is sugar, it's going to give you an insulin spike. And when your insulin jumps up, it says, whoo, whoo, hold on to this, hold on to this. We may not get any more food later. And so it shuttles that into your fat cells and it holds on to it for later usage. That's what your fat cells are there for, y'all. That's what your fat cells hold on to. That's why your fat cells hold on to everything. They hold on to hormones. They hold on to fat. They hold on to sugar. They hold on to salt. They hold on to all that stuff because it's your body's insurance policy for starvation mode. Okay, so the whole calories in, calories out thing is just a thing of the past. It just doesn't work. However, hormonal control, hormonal restriction works because if you lower your insulin, if you keep your insulin low, then your body, sorry, that was my daughter. I forgot to put it on, do not disturb. If you keep your insulin low, then your body doesn't know to hold on to fat because the insulin didn't tell it to hold on to it. You see what I'm saying? So here we go. We're going to talk about long-term inflammatory issues. She just sent me a message, y'all. So let's talk about people who have had inflammatory autoimmune disorders for a very long time. Crohn's disease, RA, obesity, all of those things. Now do you think that it's going to be super fast for you to lose that weight and get rid of that inflammatory response, that issue? Your body's going to take a little time because your body's not stupid. Your body's going to take a little time to say, okay, is this, you know, they're not giving us any of that stuff. I, I, hmm. You're going to flip into ketosis quickly in two to three days. But you're not going to become fat adapted until your body realizes, oh, she's not giving us the other stuff at all. But look at this, we've got all of this protein, this excess protein and connective tissue and excess skin and, and all of these inflamed cells and these big fat, fat molecules full of energy. We can use that. And so that's when it will flip over and you'll become fat adapted. That's when the changes really occur. But that takes time. It takes the body a little time to realize what's going on. Because before that, before you started keto, before you changed your nutrition for the better, you most likely, now I don't know that everybody did, but I know that in my case, for sure I did, you would yo-yo. 
Okay, I did the calorie restriction. I did the the fat, the super low fat. I did the lots and lots of vegetables, very little protein, very little fat. I did all of it. I did the supplements. I did the diet pills. And all that time, my body just stayed confused all the time. Because number one, every single time you eat, you trigger an insulin response. We've talked about that before. So let's talk about what we need to do to reset our body, to convince our body that, hey, I'm doing this for good. This is what I'm going to do. You are more than welcome to use all these fat stores. Here you go. Have a buffet. See what I'm saying? So here's the thing. All right. I've got all these notes wrote down, and I'm, I'm having to jump around and explain how this stuff works. We talk about, in the beginning, about how we make ketones. How do you make ketones? How do you flip over to ketosis? How do you start that fat burning process? That's called ketone synthesis. Well, here's the thing. When you have this increased inflammation, or you have these autoimmune disorders, or you have just morbid obesity, type 2 diabetes, type 1 diabetes, and your body is so focused on those things, you also have to teach your body how to utilize those ketones. So you have to have a balance between the ketone synthesis, synthesis bleh, reset, ketone synthesization, synthetization, Either way, making ketones and the utilization of said ketones. When you first flip over, okay, and when you first go into ketosis, when you first start producing ketones on your own, when your liver starts using that fat for fuel, your body doesn't really know how to break them down and use them. So it takes a little bit of time. That is called ketolysis, okay, ketolysis, or ketosis. So teaching your body to do that is why in the beginning I always recommend incredibly high fat. Yes, you may be over your fat macros, but I would rather you be up over your fat macros in the beginning until we get you to a place that your body understands that this is now the way that it is going to function. This is where it's going to get its cellular energy. Because your body has to learn to take that BHB, which is that ketone body, out of your bloodstream, break it down into little pieces, shuttle it into the cells to the mitochondria, which is the energy, the energy, I guess plant, okay? It's the energy plant. It's the energy. It's where the energy is made. And it gives it to the mitochondria so that it can break it down for cellular energy. So to teach it that, we have to say, you're not getting that other mess anymore. This is what I'm going to give you. I'm going to give you fat. I'm going to give you fat. Good fat. Here's good fat. And once that starts to happen, once you start to fat adapt, once your body starts to break down that BHB and start to utilize it in a useful manner, and you start seeing the benefits, you start seeing the, the no more fatty fingers, no more sausage fingers, the tangling in your fingers goes away, the brain clarity comes about, the hunger drops because you don't have that grayling just jumping sky high and telling you that you're hungry, hungry, hungry. When all that starts to happen, that's when you can say, okay, now, now I'm going to focus on these macros and I'm going to get myself down to where I'm only eating enough fat to keep me from being hungry. I'm going to eat my protein so that my muscles are in good shape and I'm giving my body the protein it needs. There are no essential carbohydrates, y'all, so if you don't eat any carbs a day, I don't mind. Absolutely stay below 20, but if you decide to go carnivore keto and you're not eating any carbs, there are no essential carbs. Your cells are not made up of carbohydrates at all. They are not essential. What is essential is the vitamins and nutrients contained in that real food. 
So you're going to get that amount of protein that you need for your body so that you get prime optimization of that, that nutrient, that, that protein, that, I don't know how I want to say this, that nutrition. And then with fat, you eat your fat to satiety, making sure to stay above your BMR. And that's really all you have to do. So in the beginning, I don't want you to worry about the calories. I don't want you to worry about how much fat you're intaking. I want you to intake as much fat as you can in the beginning. Teach your body. Stoke that fire. Then when that hunger starts to drop off, that's when you can say, okay, I'm going to back it up now. And, I'm, and that's where most of us are at at this point in the third week. We're at the point that, okay, all this good stuff's happening. You know, I, I've started to notice that that I'm feeling so much better and I'm sleeping good and, and this, that, and other, you know, all that's going on. Well, now it's time to say, okay, now we're going to get serious. Now we're going to get really strict. Now we're going to really start tracking. Okay? Now is when, hey, Michelle, now is when you start dropping that fat back to where you're just getting enough to stay above your BMR, getting enough protein for your body's needs, Vegetables, if you if you want them, I mean that's that's all about you, staying under 20 grams protein, and that's when your body's going to really start utilizing your body fat. That's when you're going to start to see the whoosh, okay? Because at this point, it's going to be really easy to start the intermittent fasting because you're not hungry anymore. And now I want to talk about that's what I wanted to flip over into was to talk about the benefits of intermittent fasting. So a few minutes ago I talked about how your body is run by hormonal responses. <laughs> there are lots of hormones in your body. We started talking about this a little bit last night. I want to really get into it tonight. That's what I was wanting to hear from Jason Fung today when I watched this interview. And I haven't finished the interview. There's about 45 minutes left on it. But I just really, he breaks it down in a way that is incredibly easy for me to understand. That's Brittany, that's all that you have to do, honey, and you have to find and make sure, just like with the bacon, that you're not getting any sneaky sugars and creepy carbs that are coming in there and hijacking you because that can happen. We can be, y'all, she was completely right. When I was at the grocery store this morning, I was like, I'm gonna look at that Wright's bacon. Because it should have on there the added sugars for the applewood smoke, but it doesn't. It doesn't mention anything about it on there. It says that it's zero carb, just like heavy whipping cream says it's zero carb. Well, heavy whipping cream is not zero carb. It's 0 0.4 per serving. And with applewood smoke, with that applewood flavoring, there's carbs there. And they're sweet carbs. It's a, it's a sweet taste. It's a sweet trigger which raises insulin okay and you could very well be getting that from other places as well hey Belinda oh I love your emojis real food yeah and the thing is is that you have to give your body time and that's be patient Brittany continue to feed your body those good fats coconut oil avocado Don't feel guilty. Don't feel guilty. Everybody's going to make a mistake. Just forgive yourself and keep on trucking. You'll be fine. You'll be just fine. This is not an end-all, be-all thing, y'all. It's not. It's about learning. And you learn every day. And as you learn, you'll tighten things up as you learn. And then things will move a little more and you'll you'll learn a little something else. Believe me, this 18 months has been nothing but a learning experience for me. And I have made those same exact mistakes. It's just that now, further down the road, hindsight is 2020, now I understand why I had those problems and that's why I do these videos and I do these chit chats so that I can explain to you how that kind of stuff happens. So, 
Savannah, if you are on the live, I will get with you just after the live, honey, because I can't respond to you while I'm on here. All right. <clears throat> but thank you for sending me the message. I will definitely respond to you as soon as I get done. Let your kids eat all that other. Your kids and your family. You ain't got to throw it out. So... When every single time you eat, let's let's look at back. I want us to take a look at how we eat now and how we used to eat. Oh, heavens to Betsy. I'm kind of glad I did look at that. So this person is trying to tell her that keto is bad for the kidneys because ketones are an acid. Ketones are not an acid. Well, they are. They're an, a, an, a type of amino acid, but they do not make your blood acidic. What makes your blood acidic is if your glucose and your ketones are both high at the same time. So, that is a misconception that many people do not know. Alright, so I will address all that. I just had to take a peek at it because I saw something about an ER and I have to take a look at that. I've never heard of a green protein menu. Is that like a, like the grass fed, that kind of thing? Anyways, all right, so let's look back when, like even when I was a kid, back in the 70s. My mom fixed three meals a day. She fixed breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And if I came asking for a snack between breakfast and lunch, she was like, no, you're not getting a snack. That'll ruin your lunch or that'll ruin your dinner. And you didn't eat snacks. You ate three times a day. Now, granted, those three times a day were set because back in them days, that was the big thing. You know, breakfast was at this time, lunch was at this time. And my mom always did them at the exact same time every day because my dad worked and she made sure that dinner was on the table when he walked in and that kind of thing. But we only ate about three times a day. A study was done recently with an app on a phone, and they had 100 people use this app for 30 days. And literally what they did on the app was every time they ate, whether it was a snack, whether it was, you know, they were just tracking is what they were doing. But this college regulatory group was tracking what they were tracking. And it said, you know, when they ate, how much they ate. And then this regulatory group went back at the, after that 30 days and they broke it down into the top 10 and the bottom 10%. Here's the thing, y'all. Only 10% of those people were eating less than five times a day. That means 90% or at least 90 of those people were eating more than five times and up to 10 times a day. In fact, the top 10 average, the top 10% averaged eight to 10 times a day because that's what the standard American diet and ADA and everybody recommends nowadays. You eat three meals and three small snacks to keep your your metabolic rate at a regular rate. Hmm, that's not how it works. The science of it shows us every single time you eat, you cause an insulin response. When you cause an insulin response, the insulin tells your body, store this for fuel, store this for later. So every time you eat, you're telling your body to store it. So in essence, every time you eat, you're saying, put this back, put this back. Every time you eat, you're telling your body to make you fat. But if you let those insulin levels drop and get down low, then your body uses those stores because that's what they're there for. So with keto, what happens is you drop that insulin, you start tapping into those stores, you get to a point to where you're not hungry anymore, 
So here we get into intermittent fasting. If you stimulate your insulin all the time, or you eat all the time, every two hours or whatever, which is what many diabetics are told that they should eat no, no less than every four hours. They should include so many carbs with every meal to maintain insulin levels. Sounds great, Candace. Around here, I pretty much just depend on folks that hunt. And you can't get much more free range than that. <laughs> but yeah, all of y'all in other cities, absolutely look into the green proteins in your free range meats. If you have a local butcher, that's a great, that's a great suggestion. So, <clears throat> if you eat all the time, then your fat cells are getting fat and filled up. Your leptin goes up. And now you have leptin resistance. So now not only do you have insulin resistance, you have leptin resistance. Leptin is your feel full hormone, y'all. Leptin is the hormone... Yeah, we have Blaylocks. I get meat from Blaylock every two weeks. And they're, they're a great butcher, y'all, and they have great meat. So, but I get most of my other stuff, you know, like deer meat and bear meat. Bear meat's good. It's good and fat. I didn't used to eat it, but I do now. So then you have insulin resistance and leptin resistance. So now not only is your body not responding to the insulin and it's not doing what it's supposed to do and it's not listening, then it's not listening to leptin either. So your body doesn't know you're full. So it's not telling you that you're full. So how do you fix that? To fix that, you have to work on your insulin because insulin is the first hormonal response. Dropping that insulin, allowing that insulin to stay low for an extended time. And now I'm not talking about five or six days. <coughs> you can get to that point, but I'm talking about getting yourself into a good habit of extended or intermittent fasting, even if it's only three days a week. When you get to a place where you're not hungry anymore, if you can get yourself to where three days a week you only eat between the hours of one and five. Exactly. And Brittany, that's such a great point. And you hear it from Dr. Barry. You hear it from Dr. Fung. Back in the caveman days, they didn't get their meat. You know, they didn't go out and kill a buffalo and eat a little bit of it and then store it because they had no way to store it. They would dehydrate the protein, but they ate all the fat and they ate all the organ meats as soon as they killed it because that was what gave them the most energy and it helped to hold them for times when they had no food, when they didn't kill anything. And so th that is when that extended fasting came into play. You know, that was natural for them back then because they would, it was feast and famine. Feast and famine. So now you have to make that choice. And even if you start out only doing it a couple times a week or three times a week and you move up once you start feeling those, because I promise you, once you start feeling the benefits of it, you'll want to do it more often. When I first started, I did Monday, Wednesday, and Friday and I would eat only between 1 and 5. Well, actually, when I first started, I was doing 11 to 5. So that I had a 6-hour window. And I was doing an 18-hour fast. Because after about 16 hours is when you really start tapping into those fat stores. And at 18 hours, I would eat. Well, then I realized how good I was feeling. I thought, I'm going to shorten that eating window a little bit and so I moved it up and I started only eating between one and five and so I was doing a 20 hour fast three times a week and then one day a week usually from Saturday night to Sunday night I would do a 24 hour fast and it wasn't really on purpose it was just Sunday was my lazy day that was the day that I slept in I didn't eat breakfast I didn't that was the day that I could just hang out and so that day, I may eat at 
6.30 on Saturday evening, 6.30, 7 o'clock on Saturday evening. And then I wouldn't eat again until Sunday night around 7. So I was doing three 20-hour fasts and a 24-hour fast during the week. And y'all, I cannot tell you, that is when I really started losing the weight. That's when I really started feeling the benefits of the inflammation dropping. And so that's where I want to get back to. Right now, I'm doing a 16-8 which I'm only doing 16 hours of fasting right now. And I've been eating between 9 and 5 and that kind of thing. Brittany, you cannot have BPC during the fast. You can break your fast with BPC, but you can't have it during the fast. Because any time that you take in those calories, even if all you're putting in your coffee is heavy whipping cream, you're still breaking your fast. Now, Dr. Fung does say in his book, The Obesity Code, and he also says in the fasting book, that if the only way you can make it is to get up in the morning and have that coffee with a tablespoon of heavy whipping cream, that you'll probably be okay because it's not a huge spike, but it's better to do the entire fast with no calories. No calories, no carbs, no protein for the entire fast. So you're talking about black coffee, water. That's pretty much it. Because if you do sweet taste, like if I do my celestial teas during my fast, I get hungry. Because that sweet taste causes an insulin response. So when I was doing my fast... Y'all, I must be going to get some money. My, the palm of my hand is just itching like crazy. Somebody must be about to send me some money. And sweet tea should be fine. As long as there's no calories. It's just like drinking black coffee. So unsweet tea should be fine. So, here's what happens. With intermittent fasting, it's all about timing. Insulin blocks lipolysis, or the breakdown of fat. Okay, Lipo means fat. Lysis means to break or to destroy. So insulin blocks lipolysis. Insulin tells your body to store fat. So if you drop your insulin, then you're going to burn fat. And the surplus stores tell your body that it doesn't need to drop your metabolism. Because here's what they also discovered when they were talking about this calorie restriction to lose weight. When you calorie restrict, your body self-regulates. Your body has a thermostat just like you have a thermostat on your house. In your house, if you set your thermostat to 68 degrees and you don't touch it all year, which is what I've always been taught to do, but you don't touch it all year. And you have it set on auto. If it's pouring rain outside and it's 34 degrees like it is today, then your thermostat in your house will kick the heat on to keep the inside of your house 68 degrees. Then in the summer, when it's 85 degrees outside, it will turn the air conditioning on to cool your house to 68 degrees, to maintain that 68 degrees. Okay? Your body has a thermostat too. It's called your hypothalamus. And here's the thing. Your body has a set point, And that set point changes depending on the nutrition delivered to your body, to your cells. So let's say that you normally eat 2,000 calories a day. And you decide, I'm going to lose weight, so I'm going to drop myself down to 1,200 calories a day. Well, when you drop yourself to 1,200 calories a day and you're on that for a few days, your body says, whoa, 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 we're only getting 1,200 calories a day. We're going to have to drop this metabolism down a little bit because our metabolism is too high now because your body wants to maintain homeostasis. So it actually drops your metabolism. They saw this happen in The Biggest Loser. They lost tons of weight, but it was because they are starving. When they got out of The Biggest Loser and they started eating regular food again, they all just ballooned right back up. Because during The Biggest Loser, when they were calorie restricting so much, their metabolisms dropped drastically. Drastically. 
to the point that even taking in 800 calories a day, they still were not losing weight. They were having to work out eight hours a day to maintain that weight loss because their body's thermostat, the hypothalamus, dropped that rate of metabolism to accommodate the nutrition that was being taken in. Now, with insulin, if you don't worry about the calories and you just worry about the nutrition, when you drop your insulin for a while, the insulin will drop, you'll start burning fat, and your body doesn't drop your metabolism. In fact, your metabolism goes up because all of a sudden there are all these excess stores for energy. And so your insulin will drop, your leptin will go up, which means that then when you eat, you get full much faster because your body doesn't really need it. Your body said, oh, I don't really need that. I've got plenty of fat stores. I'm good. And during a fast, now it doesn't happen, this part doesn't happen until you do an extended fast. On an extended fast, around 24 hours with no food, No, Lynn, you're not starving because your body has become fat adapted to use fat for fuel. You're not starving. When your body is a sugar burner and you don't eat anything, then you go into starvation mode and that kicks you into ketosis. But the problem with that is then they eat every two hours. Even if they're only doing 800 calories, they'll eat every two hours and eat little small. You remember how those diets worked? You can have a yogurt at 6 o'clock. You can have two carrot sticks at 10 o'clock. You can have, you know, half a banana and a cracker. Do you remember how that works? But in, ke in ketosis, when you're doing the keto diet, you're feeding your body fat and when you go into a fast, your body still has fat because you have all this and this, which I don't have much of that left. Look at that, y'all. Hee <laughs> Even the one that was left over is almost gone. Yay! So, your body doesn't go into starvation mode. Instead, your body's like, oh, I have plenty of fat. That's what we're using for energy. That's what I'm going to do. Now, there are cells in your body that require glycogen which is a breakdown from protein. So what your body does is this is when gluconeogenesis comes into effect. At about 24 hours of extended fasting, gluconeogenesis will jump in and it will start breaking down the excess protein. That is not the muscles in your body, y'all. That is a false conception. What it starts breaking down is the excess connective tissue which is the tissues between your organs. It's the excess fat, the excess, those cells that have died. The, when you had the apoptose, which is when your cells burst open and release all the fat and the hormones and the ick and a blah, which causes you to just feel like blue those first few weeks or those first few days. Yeah. But all those little cell membranes and stuff, that's excess protein. So your body starts grabbing hold of that and it turns it into glycogen for those few cells in your body, for those few organs in your body that require glycogen. And then it starts to jump into that excess skin. It starts to regenerate your skin. That's when you start to see your skin really starting to clear up because that's when your body goes into that mode where it says, oh, well, we really don't need that stuff. Okay, we're not starving. We have plenty of access to all the protein we need and, and really all the fat we need. Let's just use this up. So at 24 hours, you're gonna start go into that gluconeogenesis. So it starts using that up. At about 24 to 36 hours is when all of a sudden, that's when your fight or flight hormones, your 
um, adrenaline and noradrenaline kick in. And that's when you'll get this crazy amount of energy. You would think that if you'd been fasting for 24 to 36 hours that you'd feel like crap. But when you are in ketosis, when you are fat adapted and your body knows how to use that fat and that excess protein in your body to fuel all your systems, at about 24 to 36 hours, you see your body says, hey, and it kicks out some adrenaline and you've got some energy and you feel great. You're not hungry. Once you get through that 24 to 36 hour period, that's usually when you can say, eh, okay, I made it. I have not made it past that 36 hour. I, I've made it to about 32, 33 hours is about all I've made it to. But it wasn't because I was hungry. It wasn't because I was starving. It wasn't because of any of that. It was just a mental block for me. <laughs> so then what happens there is then your growth hormone starts to go up. Now this is when extended fasting really starts to help. Days after 36 hours, really no matter how long you go after that, I, I've seen people go up to 30 days, and that's just, to me, that's just crazy. But I've, I've read about them, and Jimmy Moore has done, he did like a 21-day fast, I think. But I, I don't see myself doing that. But lots of people do seven-day fasts. And I saw somebody post the other night that they had done an eight-day fast. And they were just tore up because they'd done an eight day fast. But after that 36 hours, then your growth hormone starts kicking in. Because your growth hormone is what builds your muscles, right? Now, if you don't have any protein coming in, what is your growth hormone going to use? What's it gonna break down? It's gonna break down that excess protein, that excess skin, the skin tags, the old dead skin, the psoriasis, the eczema, the connective tissue between your organs that has built up, all of those things. Now, it's going to just go sky high. It will multiply three to five times. So when you refeed, when you come off your fast and you start eating protein again, then it's going to want to replace the protein it's used, but it doesn't put it back into, you know, places that it wasn't needed. It's not going to give you excess skin or skin tags or anything like that. It naturally, the growth hormone naturally uses that protein to rebuild muscle. And that's why you see a lot of people that do extended fasting that aren't bodybuilders or weightlifters or anything like that. They actually have more muscle mass when they're after they fasted even though they're not lifting weights Danny Vega was talking about this with Dr. Barry the other night because somebody had made a comment on their post about fasting and how you would lose muscle muscle mass well that's just not true the body is equipped to do these set point type things It is most definitely better to exercise during a fast. And actually for keto, the best exercise is heavy lifting. Now, I do a lot of cardio, that's just, but I'm working on my respiratory system and trying to build my respiratory system. But the best exercise for keto is heavy lifting because it helps to build muscle mass and it helps to give your body, because the more muscle mass you have, the higher your metabolism is too. That's the reason men burn fat faster than women do, y'all. Because they have more muscle mass naturally than we do. So, I know that that's aggravating too. But yeah, lift heavy things. <laughs> I'm about to, um, I'm, I've kind of fell off of my cardio. I was doing a daily workout on my beach body on demand thing and I kind of fell off of that because I got so busy with work and everything and we had some emergencies happen and all that and I'm not a morning person and I found that I can't work out at night because if I work out at night then I don't sleep. So I have to work out early in the day and I'm not a morning person. So I'm trying to work on my sleep first so that I can get myself to a point where I can wake up early so I can do my workout. Because that one day that I did that, I felt so good all day. 
I mean, I really, really did. So I really want to get to that point, but that's something I'm, I'm in another group with my partner, Susie Nixon Flaherty that y'all have met before and y'all see her on my page a lot. She is doing a 21 day thing in her group for new year, new you. And it's all about movement. And I feel really bad because I kind of fell off of it, but she posted a thing about goals and that's something that I have not done. And I need to. I need to sit down and write down my goals because my first goal right now needs to be to get my sleep fixed so that I'm sleeping and getting to bed earlier so that I can get up in the morning and do my workout so that I'd feel better. Okay, so a fast, fasting breaks down the old crap to build new stuff. That was what Jason Funk said and I thought that was really funny. And his other thing that he said is calorie restriction is the wrong problem, so you get the wrong solution. Because with calorie restriction, you're focusing on the wrong thing, and what you end up getting is your body regulating your thermostat and dropping your metabolism, which is absolutely what you do not want to do. What you need to focus on is your hormone levels. So that, I'm surprised that did take almost an hour. And I'm super, super happy about all that. Do y'all have any questions about this? We'll try to go into more detail if y'all want to. But then it gets really scientific. So, the gist of tonight's live. We're in the third week. Most of us. If you are at a point that you are naturally not hungry... I want you to make a decision, and you can let me know. Absolutely. Candace, I'm about to get off right now, so you didn't miss anything. Love you. Tell Zoe I said, hey, be careful driving out there in that mess. So, if you are to a point that you're not hungry anymore, I want you to start yourself off, even if you decide to start at 14 hours, okay? Okay. The meal that you do the most or that you feel like helps you most, if it's your breakfast, if it's your BPC, then time your fast off of that, okay? So, say like me, I drink my BPC between 8 and 10 o'clock. So, if I'm going to do a 14-hour a fast, that's going to be an 8-14-hour fast. That's going to be a 10-hour eating window. So, I could eat between or I could consume calories between 8 and 6 p.m., okay? If I know that I have to have that BPC for my day to function, then I know that if I'm going to do a 10-hour fasting window and do a 14-hour or a 14-hour fasting window and a 10-hour eating window, then it would be from 8 to 6 p.m. If I'm not hungry after my BPC, then I can push all the way to, say, 5.30 before I eat. Okay? Just make sure that when you do eat, you get in enough calories to meet your BMR needs. Okay? Make sure that you're getting in enough calories to meet your BMR needs. If you do not know your BMR and you need a macros calculation, contact me. It's $10. I'll do it for you. Or you can go over to the YouTube channel. If you have not subscribed, please do so and watch the macros calculation video. It will walk you through it step by step. Then, when you've gone that, let's say we did that 10-hour window for a week and we're like, whew, well, that wasn't hard at all. Then drop it to 8. Then I may bump my BPC and say, okay, I'm not going to drink my BPC until 9. So now my eating window is going to be from 9 to 5. And so I'll consume all my calories between 9 and 5. And you can slowly start to bring that in and lower that eating window until you can get past that 16 hours. Because that 16 hours is when you really start getting some benefits. 16 to 18 hours is when you really start seeing it. And if you're only going to intermittent fast, I recommend um, personally that you try to get yourself to a point that you can do an 18-hour fast at least three times a week. Because just that two-hour window in there 
is when you're going to see incredible benefits. If you get to where you can do it every day, then try starting to do a 20-hour fast two days a week with your 18-hour fast. Then you just kind of start bringing it down. One meal a day is hard to do because you have to get all of your calories and all your fat and everything in in one meal, and it can leave you feeling very just bleh to try to get that much in at one time. So I usually try to do two. So that's, that's just me. My closing comments here for everybody, please make sure you're eating enough fat, okay? I ain't worried about y'all eating carbs. If you don't want to eat vegetables, don't eat vegetables. I don't care. That should be the only place you're getting carbs from is vegetables. If you don't want to eat them, if you want to do carnivore, do it. But make sure you're getting enough fat because that's the only way that you're going to teach your body to do what it needs to do, that you're going to teach it to change metabolic processes. And that's when you're going to start seeing the benefits. So that's all I've got to say about that tonight, y'all. And I'm going to get back to, I'm going to go wash some more dishes. I hate washing dishes. I hate washing dishes. I'm not even going to lie. I want a dishwasher so bad. Never had one. Except for when I was, you know, living in apartments and stuff. But I've lived in this house now for 18 years. Almost 19 years. And I've never had a dishwasher. But because I'm on gravity water, I'm kind of scared to get one. Because I feel like it would probably gum up a lot. So anyways, saying goodnight to you tonight. Happy Saturday. Tomorrow's going to be a great meal prep. I'm going to do the chicken that I did today. Oh, it was delicious. It was a variation of something that I saw on somebody else's post. Pam Sharp had posted it. And my mom really had a... I had an, uh, a positive reaction to it and I did not want to do the cream cheese because cream cheese has carbs and I didn't want to do the cream cheese today I've been doing a lot of cream cheese so today I did a variation and I did ricotta cheese with green chilies and chicken thighs and cheddar cheese and y'all it was delicious it was delicious. So I'm going to be doing that one. I'm also going to be doing a stuffed thigh bacon wrap. It's going to be thighs wrapped with bacon. Either that or I'm going to do a pork loin wrapped in bacon. A stuffed pork loin wrapped in bacon. One of the two. So those are two of the things that we'll do this week. And I may look into something else. By the way, Y'all, the giveaway tomorrow night is incredible. It is a meal prep. It's a kitchen meal prep bag, and y'all are going to absolutely love it. It is a bag full of goodies. One thing included in it, I showed it to Angie earlier today, is a brand new kitchen scale for your kitchen. There will also be some measuring cups and measuring spoons and all kinds of other goodies for meal prep. So it's a big meal prep bag. So tomorrow's giveaway is great. So make sure you get those check-ins done so that you get your entry into the check-in challenge giveaway tomorrow evening. I'm not sure what time it will be. It'll probably be around set, you know, 6, 37, somewhere around there. But um, not real sure what time as of right now. It's all going to depend on work schedules with children. So you guys have a great night. I love y'all to death. Stay safe if you're in the areas where it's storming. There's lots of storms going on across the country right now with wind and tornadoes and snow and ice. So be super careful. Take care of yourself. Put yourself first. Put your health first. I love y'all. Sassy Keto Nurse signing off.